Welcome back, Shaliners. Today, we're finally going to get to the topic that I know we've been waiting for, and I actually filmed it already, and the sound was so bad I couldn't use it. And you know when, like, you're writing an essay or something, and, like, your computer freezes, and you lose it all, and you're like, I'm going to go jump off this, off the roof. And I never want to think about this assignment again. It was like that. I just, like, couldn't stand it. But I sucked it up for you guys because I know you've been wanting to talk about this. Brad Pitt's new girlfriend. Now, a week or so ago, I asked you guys, like, what's the topic? Like, what do you think the topic is? Is it dating older guys? And you guys were like, yes, but also, girl, it's just like Angelina Jolie, but also Jennifer Aniston mixed together. I'm happy he's happy, and I like this girl. She seems nice, but she also seems very familiar. So we're going to talk about not only the pros and cons of dating older guys, because I think that's, that is important, we're also going to talk about the science of attraction. We like to think that love is just like, I don't know, it's just like love, it's chemistry, no one can predict it. Actually, we can predict it very, very easily. I'm going to cite some really interesting studies. So I've been reading about this and compiling some facts. So we're going to get into it. And you can find out maybe a little bit more about your choices that you're making with dating. But first, reminder to follow me on Instagram at ShallonXO. Also, if you guys would like a video shout out, a birthday pep talk, and I'm sorry, get a romantic question answered, find me on Cameo at ShallonXO. It's a really fun, like video interactive thing that we do. Also, be sure to head on over to InfStream. It's our subscription, uncensored, ad-free platform, two bucks a month. I do some cool story times over there. We will also be doing a lot of Evil Week on InfStream because I know that all my enemies are just like gagging for me to say something incendiary. Well, honey, Evil Week's gonna be a lot of that. And if you hate me and you wanna make videos about me, you're gonna have to pay for the privilege. Anyway, let's talk about Brad and Nicole. Yes, her name is Nicole, I can never say it right, Podorowski. She's a German model, she's 27. And fun twist, she is also married. Wait, what? I think that this is like sort of delicious poetic justice for Brad because last time he fell in love with someone, Angeline Jolie, he was the one who was married. So perhaps he has a bit of an elastic view of what fidelity is and what marriage, marriage vows actually mean, right? So she's dating, I'm sorry, she's married to a 68 year old. That sounds awesome. And they've been together. They've been married for eight years. So she was 19 when she married a man who was 60 daddy issues and they have a, a son together a meal so he's like a famous restaurateur and they actually met at one of his restaurants brad and nicole when he was in town doing press for once upon a time in, in hollywood in august 2019 2019 not 2019 and then they went to a kanye west concert and like he's taken her to um the chateau he owns in the south of france where he lived with angelina jolie and people like can you believe he would do that that a man would take a woman to his home? Yes, I can believe that. I can believe that. I mean, do you blow your house up every time you break up with somebody? Neither do celebrities, okay? So it's gonna be inevitable that he's probably gonna take her to some place Angelina's little feet tread. It just happens. But they seem kind of cute. She seems pretty and sort of innocuous. But you know what? I kind of think that's his thing. And yes, he was with Angelina for so long. I believe Angelina was a serious overcorrection from Jen. And we've done videos on Brad and Angelina and why they broke up the whole thing. Go check that out. It's on Retro Bay Week. Uh, we have a playlist about a whole bunch of retro couples. <clears throat> and basically, Angelina was just so all over the place that like, that's what a lot of men want. King Henry VIII, for example, after he beheaded Anne Boleyn, who was very Angelina Jolie-esque, just like saucy and witty and sexual and not giving him a son and a little too saucy and witty and sexual and just challenged him and like wasn't this mashed potatoes that he wanted from a wife. So he married Catherine Howard next, who was described as like plain and obedient. And he was like, oh, he was just delighted by her. She died in childbirth and he mourned her forever. When he had his official portrait painted at the end of his life, it was with his children, him and his dead third wife, Catherine Howard, not the woman he was currently married to. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Fucking crazy. My point is people are big on overcorrections. And so that is one explanation for why he's with her. And because she seems like, 
Angelina seemed like a big overcorrection from Jen, who was just so boring, didn't want to have kids. You know how I feel about Jennifer Aniston. Seems like a nice woman, but very bleh, just kind of boring. You know my big evidence for this is that she vacations in Cabo. She lives in Los Angeles. Cabo is maybe a two-hour flight. She could go anywhere in the world. She doesn't do shit all day. She goes to the same resort, stays in the same room at the same time every single year. That's her big trip. Would you not be on a private jet 24-7 if you were? I would. I would never be home. I just, it, so, but that's just her. Just like, okay. And so Angelina was like, I want to give birth in Africa and fuck on a plane and be launched into space and suck your dick while I'm doing it. Just all of this stuff. And maybe Nicole is kind of a little bit of both. She's a mom, so she's stable like that, but she's still young and spunky and German and they're interesting people. So hopefully he's done the overcorrection thing and he's come to a more median place. But we cannot deny Homegirl looks like his exes. She looks like a like a mall photo booth morph of Jen and Angelina put together. Like Angie's face, Jen's complexion, you're like, damn. So it makes you wonder, is this girl like a hurt locker? Or actually, is she the manifestation of a different hurt locker Brad has? Is he actually over Jen? Is he over Angelina? Because if he was, would he be dating someone who looked like this amalgam of both of his ex-wives? Well, there's some, you know, there's something to be said for, no, he's clearly not over these women. I know that you guys have experienced this, where it's like the first person to break your heart or like your first love or maybe even your first celebrity crush, you kind of like look for them in other people. I, it's, I think men do this physically, like they will have like, you know, an obsession or like a, a first girlfriend or whatever. And it's like she was blonde and tall. So they only date blonde, tall women, right? We do this kind of emotionally. It's like I have historically dated athletes. And so when my hurt, lock, both my hurt lockers were basically pro athletes. And I am very, very attracted to athletes as a result. And I realize it's because I'm simply trying to replicate those boys that I lost. I am. But, you know, history is not destiny. Right. And we are not animals at the whim of our instincts. No, we have cogniz cognitive thoughts and processes that we can stop and be like, Shallon, the only reason you're swiping on this guy is because he's a D1 athlete. He looks boring, annoying, fuck boy, too short, whatever it might be. But you are fixed on this athlete thing. But that's because you miss boy one and boy two. So let's Stop with the swipey fingers and let's go work on that. Let's try to dig out those emotional splinters. And sometimes you have to pull splinters out more than once. I mean, hopefully not in real life, but in these emotional circumstances, you do. But there's larger evidence that says, eh, Brad's taste and all of our tastes is not necessarily a function of a hurt locker situation, although it can be. It's a function of evolution. But before I get into that aspect, I do want to talk about the older men thing because this all ties in. This all ties in. So, as you know, I do not date older men. I do not date older men. I date younger men. Why? Well, the reason we choose our partners, the too long didn't read of this video, is mateability, right? And this is on both sides. Men choose women who seem the most fertile. They are actually, men can tell when we are at our fertile peak in our cycle, they might not cognitively know that, like, that girl in the grocery store is ovulating, but they are more attracted to the sound of our voice when we are at peak fertility, like our voice goes up just a little bit. We smell different to them, right? Conversely, women's tears give off a, like a unconscious smell that is repellent to men. Why? Well, the conclusion that scientists draw is like, a crying woman can't take care of your child. If she's a depressive, then she's not going to be able to raise your young and continue your bloodline, right? And that's, I mean, that's not a crazy conclusion to draw. Of course it's not a crazy conclusion to draw because mother nature herself drew it, right? And that's what you need to keep in mind watching this video. These are scientific things. These aren't character judgments, value judgments, because a lot of what we want to do, we're modern, is a modern society, is pretend like we've invented sex. We've invented it. Oh, I've invented beauty norms and everything's different. It's 2020 now. None of that mattered. Bitch, ain't nothing new under the sun. 
And human evolution moves at an absolutely glacial pace. So if you think the things people were attracted to like 400 years ago are not the exact same things they're attracted to now, yeah, wrong. And women on the flip side want a man who is a provider. And this is an interesting word because I think provider manifests differently for for we like to think, oh, for, uh, for me as an individual, I'm so individual. You know what? That's true. Of course we are. We're all special snowflakes in our own way. But the way provider manifests comes down oftentimes to money. Studies show that women in poorer areas and countries are attracted to more masculine looking men, but women in more developed, wealthier countries or societies are attracted to more, to less masculine looking men. I won't say feminine, but masculinity is ranked lower on their attractiveness list than women in poorer countries. That's interesting, right? But again, it makes sense if you look at this from a providership standpoint. If you live in a poor place, chances are you might live in kind of a violent place. There might be a lot of crime. There might be threats against your family, your health, your safety. You want a big ass man. I do, you know, like you want that. You want someone who can like tackle whoever is going to come through that door. If you live in a wealthier place, perhaps crime is lower. Perhaps you don't need a provider in the same way. You might be making more money on your own. Having a man who can like chop wood isn't super useful to you. So you're okay with a guy who maybe weighs 40 pounds less than like the big jack dude, but he's providing you maybe with something intellectual that's more stimulating. So interesting. It's also interesting that Nicole has historically chosen much, much, much older men, much, much, much older men. So for her, providability, provider status, translates to older, more money, established. They're less likely to cheat. Maybe they've gotten it out of their system. For me, though, I'm into younger guys. I think the opposite. I look at an older guy. I was like, he couldn't run after a child that we have and like help with things. He's going to break a fucking hip. He's ready to watch Murder, She Wrote. I'm ready to watch Murder, She Wrote, too, all the time. I love it. I look at younger men as much more mateable and providery because I'm like, wow, they still have so much potential. I don't know what their earning power is yet. I don't know, like, what they're going to do in life. They still have, they're still so much more shapeable in a positive way. They have more, more and better muscle tone. And like I said, girl, they're just hotter. And they're so excited to see you topless. Oh, those are boobs. They're delighted. If you want to know more about the young man I am dating, uh, I have a video all about my boyfriend on Infstream. What is fantastic about our relationship, but also some things that are like definitely giving me pause. So anyway, back to Brad Nicole. I think it's interesting that provider ability can skew in two different ways, you know, but at the end of the day, that is when we boil it down, what we are looking for in a mate. The other thing we are looking for in a mate is symmetry. Symmetry. What? Yes. When you're a baby, you're in your womb, swimming around, parasite feeding off its hosts. When the human life is formed, cells split, right? They split neatly and evenly. At least they're supposed to split completely evenly. And if they do end up splitting 100% evenly, every single cell, you get a perfectly symmetrical person. That doesn't really happen. There's external factors, chromosomal things, <clears throat> And none of us come out symmetrical. And scientists actually throughout history, well, not history, modern history, have every so often they go on this like binge about who is the most symmetrical celebrity. And back in the day, apparently it was Greta Garbo. Doctors measured her face and declared her the most beautiful woman in the world because she was the most symmetrical, right? And recently this has been done with like doctors have examined faces of like Bella Hadid, Kylie Jenner, um, Kim Kardashian. And I think they declared Bella the most beautiful woman in the world because she's the most symmetrical. Is it a coincidence that Bella is also man-made? No. You let nature make a person, they're going to come out asymmetrical. You let a doctor make a person, well, they're going to come out pretty fucking squared away. I get fillers like I, I'm not shy about talking about it. Not a ton. Like I don't I don't I wouldn't look that different if I didn't get them. You know, it's just I like it. But when I go to the doctor, the number one question I ask them is, how do you define beauty? And if their answer is not symmetry, they ain't touching my face. And when I go to the doctor, that's what I ask them for. Because they're like, you know, like, what do you want? What do you want to do? And they're used to people saying, I want Kylie's lips. I want Kate Middleton's nose. I want so-and-so's cheekbones. That is a recipe for disaster, baby girl. And I've talked about this in, in, uh, in videos before. 
you have to work with your facial structures, your particular facial structures. What I tell them, make me symmetrical. Fill her up, doc. You're the expert. You have the ruler. You have the eye. I don't have these things. And if that means you're only injecting the left side of my face, like the Phantom of the Opera, so be it. If that's going to make me more symmetrical. Because no matter what your features are, whether you have thin lips or not super prominent cheekbones, that's okay. Symmetry is more important. Now I know what you're, I know what you're doing right now. I know what you're doing right now. You're looking at yourself in the mirror and you're like, I'm completely asymmetrical. I am, in fact, a human goblin. No, girl, you're not. It's okay. It's okay. No one is symmetrical. That's the thing. No one is. That's all right. But it is interesting to note that, like, that is a huge pull of attraction. That's people in studies have unconsciously been more attracted to someone who's symmetrical, you know, and these things are they're perceptible, but they're not necessarily noticeable unless you're like, hello. But, you know, it's something that a lot of times we can correct with makeup. Right. You just oh, a little bit. You flick the, the liner a little higher on that side to pull this eye up because it droops a little bit and like just kind of shade that lip liner in there to give that more of a, a pop because it's a little weaker. You can do so much with makeup. Thank God we have it. But when we use like face to, you know, like photo editing apps, that's the number one thing an app will do for you is make you symmetrical. It also comes down to other metrics of basically math, namely the waist to hip ratio. What's the waist to hip ratio? So when guys look at the factor of a woman's mateability and her attractiveness, what their like reptile caveman brain is telling them, not reptile, I guess mammal brain, mateability, fertility. Fertility is king when it comes to evolutionary attraction, right? How could it not be? Our whole purpose as animals, and we are animals, is to mate and continue the species. Name one animal on planet Earth that doesn't operate like that. You have penguins giving special rocks to their little lady penguin. Peacocks, it's the men that fan it out, right? Ma mallards, the ducks, they've got the head. The males have the, the lion mane. It's all to attract the female, but she has to demonstrate fertility, right? So how does that manifest in people? Well, one of those is the waist to hip ratio. Other things, big bright eyes, um, white teeth, clear skin. These are these are simply signs of health, youth, and vitality. And all of that adds up to, I can knock that chick up. I'm gonna have a baby. So the waist to hip ratio was studied most recently by a psychologist named Devendra Singh at the University of Texas. There have been tons and tons and tons of studies on the WHR. But so women with a WHR of 0 0.7, waist to hips, you divide, indicating a waist significantly narrower than the hips. So tiny waist, big hips are most desirable to men. And an analysis of hourglass figures of Playboy models, Miss America contestants, show that the majority of these women have a WHR waist to hip ratio of 0.7 or lower. In general, a range of 0.67 to 1.8 in females is attractive to men. So if you're not a perfect 0.7, that's okay. Very few of us are, but that is the most attractive to men. That's according to a 2004 study. And again, it's not changed since then. And you're thinking like, wait a minute, who... Who has that? And that, you know, I'm I'm skinnier, I'm I'm bigger, and like I can't possibly have that. No, this is not contingent on weight. And that's the great part, right? You can, like Amy Schumer says, we quote this all the time. You can catch a dick whenever you want, no matter how much you weigh. It's about the ratio. It's about that hourglass figure. And of course, not all of us have it. That's okay. Again, you can create this illusion with like belts, and I mean, there's a million ways to do this, right? But you know who has a waist to hip ratio of 0.7? Kate Moss, like a noodle she is. You know who else has it? Helen Mirren, Stone Fox Smoke Show. Who else? Scarlett Johansson, Marilyn Monroe. These women all have vastly different ages, heights, boob sizes. Kate's skinny, Marilyn was curvy, so is Scarlett thick and delicious. It's not about your weight, girl, it's not. And it's, what I find fascinating is in none of these studies, None of them talk about tits. It like literally doesn't factor into it. And that is like, oh, thank you. Thank you. Can we just take one thing off our plate as women? You're putting my waistline on it, you know, adding to it. So why is this important? Well, people who carry weight in their middle, I do, that's where I carry all my weight, are more predisposed to diabetes, 
heart disease, high blood pressure. Belly fat is very bad for you. Fat thighs, fat hips, fat bottom. It doesn't have negative health consequences. In fact, according to evolution, it implies fertility. So that's why I like the keto diet is because it takes weight off my middle. And like I said, that's where I carry my weight. So when I gain weight, my attractiveness absolutely knows dives from an evolutionary standpoint. Now, you know, like we said, we can catch a dick whenever we want. It's about confidence and stuff, but it's not not about science. And I think that that's just an important thing to keep in mind. And it's important. It's a good impetus to stay healthy, right? You're not doing your body any favors by having a lot of belly fat. You know, we're just, we don't feel good. It's bad for our inner workings. So, okay, this is what men want in us. Who fucking cares? What do we want in men? So there is an ideal waist to hip ratio that we look for in men. It's 0.8 to 1.0. But like, who's looking at a guy's waistline? It basically kind of says like, you don't want a, a dude with a pot belly, which obviously... But the studies have overwhelmingly found that broad shoulders are way more of a turn on than like abs. I think that's so true. I'm like an arm girl. Like if guys are ever like, oh, I want to send you a nude. I'm like, send me an arm picture. Send me like arm shoulders. Send me like this area because this is what I bite. When you think about it, when you have sex with someone, this is what you see. Like this area of their body, like coming at you, like on top of you. I'm not like looking at their abs unless I'm doing something else. I'm like, eh, I'm, I'm pretty good on that. Like it's nice, but shoulders for sure. But it's not just symmetry that we see in the face that leads to attractiveness. Estrogen and testosterone play a huge role. So estrogen keeps women kind of like tiny, you know, like our bone structure, tiny, smaller chins, like smaller brows. Why a smaller brow? Why don't we have like the big heavy brow that men have? It's so that our eyes look, look wider and we look more like prey. Isn't that crazy? Oh, science, man. But men, on the other hand, they have more testosterone, so they get the big jaw, the heavy brow. They look more menacing, a.k.a. more protective and therefore better able to protect you and the potential offspring that you have. <sighs> I love this shit. I love this shit. It's so interesting. It's so interesting. So let me read you this. Research reported last month. This is from, uh, what is this? LiveScience.com. This is the same study. That women both smell and look more attractive to men at certain times of the month. And symmetrical men smell better to women. A 2002 study found women prefer the scent of men with genes similar to their own over the scent of genetically identical or totally dissimilar men. Hmm. Okay. This is going to explain a lot about Brad Pitt's situation. Let me read this again. Women prefer the scent of men, so we're more attracted to men, with genes somewhat similar to our own versus nearly identical, like our family, right? Or totally opposite to us. This explains Brad Pitt's taste. Because not only does Nicole look like Angelina and Jennifer Aniston, she kind of looks like Brad, who kind of looks like Jen and Angelina, right? There's a lot of similarities there. Like sort of that tan skin, blue eyes, full mouth, same sort of shape, nose. Like there, there's more similar similarities than there are differences. And we see this all the time in people. We see couples and you, my friend was like, oh, Mormon couples always look alike. I was like, you know, that's so true. Like they're just like blonde, but they're like pretty little golden retrievers, like scampering around, breeding like crazy. I love Mormons. I grew up in a town full of Mormons and they're just such charming people. They're so cute. Um, but we see this, like we are very frequently drawn to people who look like us. And part of that is familiarity. You know, it's, it's, we, the presumption is we have more upfront things in common. Maybe we grew up in kind of a similar place. Oh, you're tall and super blonde too. Yes, we're both from Sweden. So there's, of course, people are attracted to people who you have the most things in common with, right? But to look at it from a genetic standpoint, like these studies are saying, is really, really interesting. There's more. Let me read this to you. Last year, J. Philippe Rushton, a psychologist at the University of Western Ontario, looked into the relationship of people's genes. Based on a set of heritable personality traits, having similar genetics plays a 34% role in friendship and mate selection. You are 
more likely to choose someone who has kind of similar genes to you, kind of looks like you. Not just for a mate, but for friends as well. That's really interesting, right? When you think about it, like humans are tribes people, and we kind of gravitate towards people who look like they might be in our tribe. Not to say, and again, chemistry isn't destiny. History isn't destiny. This isn't like, I can never have a brunette friend. I can never befriend someone from Korea. But it it's who we're kind of drawn to. I mean, at least 34% of us are, but 70-some percent are the main theory is that some genes work well in combination with each other, said Rushton. If these genes evolve to work in combination, then you don't want to break that up too much for your offspring. Finding a mate with similar genes will help you ensure this. So here comes the hubris and the ego of simply existing, right? And we hear this shit all the time. We hear this shit all the time. Well, I have to have kids. My genes. I have to pass on my genes. Oh, do you? Okay. Cool, yeah, you work at Jiffy Lube. Let's, we can't deprive the world of this. Not that there's anything wrong with Jiffy Lube, but you know what I mean. But we look at ourselves and we're healthy and we're productive and we're like, okay. And this is, these are all micro, these are not conscious thoughts. These are, this is the instinct of attraction. We're like, okay, this works. It's all working right here. I'm healthy, I look good. I am not, when choosing a mate, gonna fuck this up. I'm not gonna fuck this up. So I'm going to go with someone who seems like their genes are, in a way, not really contributing anything. If I could just self-replicate like a frog in Jurassic Park, clone myself essentially, and take almost no genetic material from whoever knocks me up or whoever I impregnate, that'd be awesome. So the way to do this is to find someone who looks exactly like me. That's wild to consider. It speaks to a deep, instinctual, cellular level selfishness. <laughs> Just an incredible self-aggrandizing sense of, I'm the best. I don't want your genes, but I know I like need them to like have another me, but I really just want another me because I am fucking incredible. Look at these genes. It's so interesting. It's so interesting. If your spouse is genetically similar, he writes, you're more likely to have a happy marriage. Child abuse rates are lower when similarity is high. And you'll also be more altruistic, more giving and, you know, empathetic and willing to sacrifice more for someone who is more genetically like you, research shows. Wow. That's crazy. And this is true, right? You follow Tank's Good News, you know, Tank Sinatra on Instagram. I, I don't think about him, but I follow his like good news page. And I love it because it's stories of like, rich woman loses her engagement ring, homeless man finds it and walks 20 miles to return it to her. And that proves this research theory that like, we are not necessarily hardwired to go out of our way to help people who seem other, right? But again, This can be overridden, and this is what makes us humans instead of simply animals, is we have the cognitive ability to be like, you know what? That rich white woman, that homeless black man, we might look different, but underneath the surface, are we? No. She wants the same things out of life that I want, and he has the same fears that I do, and let's come together and be productive, right? Let's come together and help each other. A cognitive high-level thinking person operates on that plane. An animal base, just simplistic person doesn't. You ain't looking like me. Get off the roof, Crystal. Crystal operates like that. Crystal operates like that. I ain't know you. You don't shop at the same Walmart. I ain't seen you at my Kohl's. I done saw you at a different Kohl's. We ain't got nothing more to say, Crystal. Right? So it's up to us how we want to interact with the world. And of course it is up to us who we date, but it is interesting that at our core, there are things driving us and fueling our choices that we are not aware of. And becoming aware of them is a factor in like, okay, you know, I can change this, but I think it also just helps explain why maybe you've chosen the mates that you have, why you've chosen hyper-masculine men, maybe men who are less masculine, Maybe older versus younger, maybe taller versus shorter, right? So the next time you're meeting someone and dating, ask yourself, are these 
factors that I feel in control of? Is, am I sensing symmetry? Am I sensing mateability? And also ask yourself if you're not. Is that fuckboy a provider? Do you see him as being able to lift the groceries and carry them up the stairs, let alone fight off an invading horde? If he's not calling you back, if he's making you chase him, have you denied nature herself? Because no animal on planet Earth has the female pursuing the male. None. And it's funny, even in these studies and in this write-up, they said something like, you know, the sex is about the woman um, being wooed and she allows herself to be courted. And they're talking about human women. And I just chuckled at that. I was like, fuck, we are, we are blowing it, dude. Like, yeah, theoretically, that's exactly how it should be. We should sit there diversifying ourselves, living a fantastic life, being in love with our own life, being interesting and bad bitchy, and let the guys impress us. And are we? Are you? I can look myself in the eye and say, no, no, historically, I have not done that. I've chased boys. The, that relationship has never worked out. Never. When I've asked a guy out, when I've texted first, when I've messaged first, nope. Sooner rather than later, it goes belly up. And you know what? Whenever I say this, I always have girls in the comments. Well, I asked my boyfriend out and we've been together for a year. Great. Have fun with your beta male. I don't want that. To me, that man is not mateable. If he's too chicken shit to ask me out or either he's too chicken shit or he doesn't care in the first place, I don't want to be with that person. That's not for me. So I would rather that play out from day one, day one. And then get caught in, you know what I call it, the passive reciprocation loop. Oh, he'll answer. Yeah, he'll meet up. He'll allow you to fuck him on a Tuesday morning, you know, before he goes to class. Is he courting you? Is he presenting himself as the most mateable? Is he bringing you little pebbles like a penguin would? No, girl, he's not. And one day he's going to ghost out. He's going to fade away. And you're going to be tearing your hair out saying, what happened? What changed? Nothing changed. He wasn't pursuing you then. He's not pursuing you now. He just stopped passively reciprocating. All right, sure, I don't know. Sure, fine, we can go meet up. Don't you deserve better than that? Hasn't like millions of years of evolution brought you to a place where you can say, no, 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 no. I deserve better than this. I deserve better than this. Maybe the baboons who first demonstrated this behavior, you know, 10,000, 20,000 years ago, whatever it is, maybe they didn't. I do. Because I'm not an animal. I'm a woman. And I know exactly my value. Exactly my value. And there is nothing that will counteract asymmetry or a out of whack waist to hip ratio than confidence. Nothing. It is the strongest force in the universe. It is the strongest force of mateability, right? And if you have that, nothing else matters. But you have to have it. You have to have that sense of self-worth, that pride, that impenetrable empirical knowledge of your value and you don't discount yourself for anyone not even brad pitt for more click like and subscribe we're going to be doing more videos this week i'm going to break down ellen degeneres's apology and jordan woods's apology uh that she recently shared on youtube i'm i don't know if i'll do two separate videos or one because they are pretty similar and like i said follow me on instagram at shallon xo if you want a video shout out find me on cameo and head on over to Instream for some exclusive content see you later shalligators